Welcome to the Video Insiders. I'm Carlos Pacheco. And I'm Tom Martin. And we're two grizzled YouTube industry veterans with billions of views between us. And we're here to give you our two cents on the business of YouTube and how you make more dollars. New strategy insights and a little bit of snark. Just a little bit. Just a little <laughs> bit. What's the word on the street for you, Tom? Well, this week, Carl, I should be very excited to know. Well, I thought you'd be very excited to know that we had some snow here. in what? London Because I know you're like the weather guru <laughs> working with the weather network. Obviously, they heard that you're, that you're Toronto's number one weather correspondent. Um, but, <laughs> but then, you know, you just rained on my parade by telling me that you had like 15 inches of snow or something crazy like that. So uh, <laughs> totally burst my... Uh, He's totally stepped to my snowman. It's very cute that you got a little bit. Of snow. Yeah, we, it didn't even. This was more like a, you know, like a, a snow. Someone had spilled a snow cone over me. You know, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't like Canadian snow. The good stuff. Uh, but no, all good over here. Working on lots, uh, lots of client work to deliver in between um, some speeches. Uh, I just announced the other day that I'll be speaking at a, an event called Traffic and Conversion Summit in San Diego. Pretty huge. It's probably going to be the biggest audience that I've ever spoken in front of the smallest room that they've got holds a thousand people pretty crazy the whole event is being headlined by Arnold Schwarzenegger no less that so uh, amazing. I'm just hoping I get to even you know get to take a selfie where he's like 200 yards away from me that'd be pretty awesome <laughs> uh, being a huge Arnie fan from back in the day you know Terminator 2 and Predator and Running Man just like Man, what what a legend! What a legend! Yeah, no, those were the so, days. Those were the days of action action movies. Right? Oh yeah, that's you know that's when you used to get a proper what you would call an R rated movie. Not like now where Terminators are like you have to be twelve years old to watch a Terminator <laughs> movie. The good old blood and guts days. So yeah, that's pretty cool. So preparing for that and working on a, a huge, huge client pitch, the biggest pitch of my life by a, by a long shot. So yeah, just every, keeping everything crossed for that. That's awesome. And yeah, uh, myself, yeah, sort of the same, keeping busy, ramping up, working with my new old client, basically, and back with Just for Laughs. And so, you know, working on with them, but from a different perspective as well, because I actually told them that I want to learn a little bit more about, you know, uh, well, obviously, I'm going to advise them on, on the YouTube stuff, but they already have a team. They're, get, they're, you know, I was sort of helping them getting started, but it's, it'll be much more about uh, learning uh, the distribution side of things, how, you know, the, the TV stuff gets negotiated and all that sort of stuff. Because I find it really interesting how, you know, the spaces I've worked, I've worked much more in a TV landscape. You know, the stuff I do is usually the last, you know, the last thing you do to a piece of content. When you put it on YouTube, you can't really sell it as much as you used to. So well, I, go ahead. I think that's definitely changing coming from, you know, so before I ever touched a single video on YouTube, I worked in um, TV content licensing and distribution for five years at the BBC. So um, I definitely think I, I kind of straddle both sides of, of that um, perspective. So maybe we should have a, an episode where we talk a bit more about uh distribution once you yeah. put your feet under the table i'd be happy to talk about my experience in the traditional world and then the the post-traditional world of youtube and now the world that i'm in where i'm trying to kind of run a distribution company myself uh, as well as all the other plates that i'm spinning so yeah i think that would be a really uh, interesting topic for people to hear about especially in a kind of post copa world where we've got a lot of youtube creators that are maybe looking for other homes for their for their kids content specifically very true yeah totally forgotten about that i forgot that perspective of, of your uh, with your distribution at the bbc uh other than that obviously uh weather is being weathery so uh we'll avoid the details on that canada is doing its thing before we get started, we're actually having another interview episode, this time with somebody who's been in the industry for quite some time. His name is Bob Jennings, and he's a executive producer and digital content strategist. He was part of the original team on Annoying Orange. I forgot which character, but he had writer, and he played, uh, I think it was not an eggplant, but one of the fruits. <laughs> he's playing one of the fruits. He does the voices of one of the fruits. But he's been in this space for so long. 
he was there when Maker got started, and he, he knows a lot of the Maker founders. So the MCN world, he's been all over the place. And he now advises creators and helps them develop business opportunities beyond YouTube, be it like merchandising or apps or creating games for them. Just finding things that where uh, a creator that has a large audience can make money outside of just, you know, the, the, view, the views. So I've been wanting to talk to him for ages and I'm glad I finally got the chance. Yeah, really looking forward to hearing what Bob's got to say. I thought I knew everyone in the YouTube industry. Bob had somehow missed my uh, deathly handshake. So uh, yeah. really looking forward, to, <laughs> looking forward to hearing Bob's story, what he's done, and then... Um, Hopefully, who knows, get to, work, get to work with him on some projects in the future. Yeah. So before we get started, we need to thank our sponsor, which is TubeBuddy. TubeBuddy is the ultimate tool for creators to streamline their daily workflow on YouTube, allowing for you as a creator to make more content. For brands to help reduce busy work and focus on what matters, growing your business on YouTube, for agencies to help manage multiple channels and for networks, which gives partners the tools for success and an attractive incentive for recruitment. Tom, is there a special offer? Yes, you can get an exclusive Video Insiders multi-channel discount by visiting videoinsiders.fm forward slash TubeBuddy. Thank you, TubeBuddy. Let's get to the interview. Bob, welcome to the show. Finally, <laughs> we've been uh, trying to coordinate for the past a little while, so I'm happy we finally made it happen. According to your bio, you're executive produ producer and a digital content strategist. Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> well, I mean, I handle all aspects of sort of uh, production. Can do that, you know, when you mm -hmm. are working that in our business, you have to be. Confident at the very least, uh, but hopefully an expert in being able to shoot and being able to edit. But a lot of times um, when you start building and working with clients who are bigger, you're able to delegate those types of things. And so that's where I guess an executive producer is. But in terms of digital cool. strategy, uh, yeah. it's just understanding, you know, 20 years of understanding, you know, where this business has come. Believe it or not, I used to work um, in 1999 at... Um, I felt the first video site, there was no transcoding on servers. And basically it would be like, let's start a video site. It was in LA and it just choked on everything. So if you remember that era, that the only things that were successful online were flash animation. <laughs> I've been socially stalking you for the past too many years. And uh, one of the best things about having a podcast is that you can get to invite people that you've been, you know, a fan of and sort of admire from, from afar. You know, talk to me a little bit about, you know, who you are, your credentials, like you, you've you been all over the place. You have so much history in this space. You know, how did you get started in the whole YouTube ecosystem? Yeah. Um, uh, so I was the type of person that would always like to make their own content even before YouTube existed. Um, I am originally from Massachusetts. I went to Emerson College. I moved to Los Angeles in 1997. And for many years, I was writing scripts and I got a job at the American Film Institute where I worked for 10 years. And while wow. YouTube was um, coming out of nowhere, I actually joined at the December 31st, 2005. That's 15 years ago. And myself and my partner, my comedy partner friend, Kevin Bruick, uh, started a channel called Wicked Awesome Films because we were making things and we found, well, if we put it up here, it won't crash our website if, uh, if uh, College Humor links us, which happened a couple of times. So mm -hmm. immediately, because we were early adopters on the platform, and one of the first, in 2006, we had quite a bit of success. We were a top comedy channel right up there with Bratz and Beretta and Smosh. And you got to meet a lot of people that was like um, a, a great energy about what was happening. And, and, and people were finding audiences. And, and nobody in Hollywood was taking us seriously, whereas now everybody is trying to do this right you know, mm -hmm. over a decade later. And that led quickly over the next year to making friendships. Um, one of them was with Dane Bodegheimer, uh, who hadn't created the Annoying Orange quite yet. And we all 
liked making videos together and we all liked football and we would hang out and at the we again so we had a channel that was called wicked awesome films and it was pretty successful but not successful enough um to quit your day job because the first two years of youtube there was no money you know <laughs> And it wasn't until around 2000, I want to say nine, when they created the, uh, they created the Annoying Orange. And that's when, that was about a year and a half into the partner program. And the year after that, he's like, do you want to come on and help me produce this? And for the next six years, I did that. You must have seen some crazy stuff happening in six years. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and almost everybody was in Los Angeles that was taking it seriously, at least the people that I knew so on, the, on the platform. As I come to find out later, there's a lot of success everywhere, but it was really fun because, because we were early adopters, Google invited us to be part of several round tables, um, help, you know, a burgeoning platform become something else. Um, in fact, when they finally, when, you know, YouTube sold to Google, I believe that was in fall of 2006, the article in the Hollywood reporter was actually a picture of myself and Kevin because we made fun of their video when they were saying two Kings coming together. And, um, <laughs> I come into work that day as the American film Institute and somebody goes, you're in the Hollywood reporter. I said, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I opened it up and there's a picture of our video. And luckily for me at the time, I, I emblazoned wicked awesome films.com right in the, the entire video. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, it was fun. Like I remember, you know, annoying orange was, the thing back in the day when I got started on, on YouTube going on seven, eight years ago. And I tend to exaggerate sometimes. I feel like it's been 10 years and, uh, I just got, uh, I sometimes still go on Facebook, even though I hate myself when I do it. I got the reminder that seven years ago this week, I was having dinner with, uh, Roman Atwood, <laughs> who was huh. this little prankster kid who, you know, came to visit, uh, us at just for laughs and uh yeah that became history uh but yeah it's crazy how much things have evolved and how many people have come and gone in this space right and you know mm -hmm. one of the things that i'm interested in is is how you know many of the frontline creators from today have sort of become the the behind the scenes producers now right it feels mm -hmm. that way a little bit uh you don't see I think there's in, in, quite a fair amount of well, that yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it, it's sort of like a little bit of, you know, mimics a little bit of Hollywood in that, in that perspective, right? Is you sort of like, you're, you're there doing, you're breaking the mold, you're figuring it out. And then as time goes, you sort of like step back and you become, you know, you go into production, the production side of things where let's be honest here, that's where real money is. <laughs> yeah. um, can, I, can I comment on that real quick? Of course. Yeah. Um, I want you to comment. Yeah, please. I think that I, I agree a lot. You know, one of the things I, experience um having been at annoying orange during its sort of zenith and it still does pretty well i still do i still do voices i'm still the grapefruit we have a gaming channel with over two million subscribers and the main <laughs> channel has over nine million subscribers but i don't produce it anymore i just again i do the voices from colorado i send them out to those guys it's fun i love still playing yeah. that character but when you say getting into production i would ask you know one little tweak to that is really the business development and what i saw when I was uh, at Orange, when we had agents being part of an, uh, a large MCN where these people, you know, they thought they were dealing with, you know, 20 somethings. I was a 30 something and mm -hmm. I was already a professional adult, you know, yeah. I would just remember dealing with these Holly people trying to get into our business and they were just over and over just screwing it up and lying. And it, everything you've heard about Hollywood usually is true. Um, and to me, I, 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 I just said, you know, enough of this, you know, I believe that my experience over those first, you know, number of seven years in, into doing orange, I was like, I know more about how to maybe source a product or help develop a video game or, you know, get these ancillary parts of, you know, um, the monetization of a brand. I, I didn't need them. And in fact, like yeah. you said, the money was in trying to develop other brands and that's where uh in addition to working with other channels i kind of branched out on my own um i also made several investments and or um advisory agreements with startups in the space um yeah and, th and that to me is super exciting 
I do wish I had more time to make content, but you know, uh, I'm not a single guy in LA anymore. I'm a fan. I have a <laughs> family with three kids. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that brings me to another question that, you know, was part of our list, um, but not in order, but now that you mentioned it, um, uh-huh. you know, we've both had, I've had many experiences with MCNs, not, as, you know, not directly working with them, but negotiating and obviously been hunted by many of them, like everybody in this space, you were, I feel like you were much more in the weeds of things, yeah. uh, being in LA and all that sort of stuff. You were in LA, right? For a bit, just uh, 15 years. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's what I understood. But so, you know, you were close to them and, you know, what's your perspective on how that industry sort of like ballooned and imploded? Um, and well, what what do you think caused it? The exposure of the fraud. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'll be straight up. I mean, um, we started a company called social blue book in the wake of the maker acquisition with a lot of, um, you know, people who were involved with Maker, um, like Shay yes, Carl, I remember. Um, exec, uh, one of the vice president of production, Chad Saley, who is, was actually the founding CEO of the company. And currently, Dan, Danny Zappin, who was the founder of Maker, is now the CEO of Social Blue Book. And that company was made in response because the MCNs were hiding the true value of brand deals from their clients and actually just straight up lying to them what they were worth, paying them $10,000 and reaping the 90% of the $100,000 deal. I, there's, I'm not going to tell you any specific instance, but I can mm-hmm. tell you that there are dozens of instances that I know, and it wasn't just Maker, and Danny wasn't even there anymore. That wasn't Dan's happen. Dan was not a part of that. If anything, that guy fought for all his friends and creators, and all those people who were the initial creators and founders of Maker, they were just YouTubers mm-hmm. that... When they sold to Disney for $650 million, almost all of those founding members had equity <laughs> and significant wow. part of it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of millionaires who yeah. have never been millionaires on their own on YouTube uh, out of that deal. And they have Dan Zappin to thank for that. But anyways, the, the, the business itself, the, the MCNs, right? They wanted a piece of everybody's channel, right? And yep. that is sort of unsustainable for the services they were providing. They'd say they would provide for them, um, but they really couldn't at scale because it was done with manpower and they weren't building technology. They weren't building, you know, platforms that would make these processes faster. They say they were a technology company, but they weren't. In fact, they didn't even own the content of all the channels that they signed, which is why the CFO of Disney was ultimately canned over the deal. A lot of people don't know that. Wow. Um, It's true. And so to me, I think overall MCNs had a bad, um, reputation because they just couldn't do what they promised. And that's why I yep. gave, uh, I think it gave rise to really smart people. I respect professional colleagues of mine, guys like Dan Levitt, who manages Matt Pat, he's an executive producer on game theory. Um, there are, mm-hmm. uh, are smart managers out there who, who filled the void and took a handful of pr- uh, premier clients, guys like Luke Steepleton at three black dot and left machinima went over with, um, I know Luke. Yeah. Syndicate and C Nanners and Vanos Gaming built an entire company off three guys because he got it and he was able to be their yep. business partner and do all the things that maybe a network couldn't do for 15,000 creators. You know, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, so mm-hmm. I think that what was ultimately exposed was the, the fraud that these guys were saying, Hey, we're onboarding these 10,000 creators. And we're going to go out and take VC capital and we're just going to bring up the value of this company and try to sell it to a sucker. That's why that business failed. Yeah. Is that candid yeah, enough? It's funny. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. Um, you know, it's funny here you say dropping these names because these are all people that I met uh, back in the day. Listeners to the podcast know that, you know, I, I joined Just for Laughs uh, seven, eight years ago and I started shopping the channel around to MCNs. And obviously they wined and dined us. Um, you know, seven, eight years ago, you know, there was Maker, there was Revision 3, there was yeah. uh, Full Screen was already still there, or all that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah, I met Luke at Machinima specifically. I remember at one of those big agent, uh, Hollywood agent offices, which I found found hilarious. Uh, as somebody who, who had no idea about, the, you know, I came from advertising, so I had no idea mm-hmm. about this whole, like, you know, Hollywood's ecosystem. But Luke was awesome. And then when he, you know, he did he did what he did, and I was like, "Oh, he's really smart." And um, again, same thing with um, Matt Pat's agent, 
who I had a conversation with a couple, maybe a year and a half ago on a, a client a proposal project. And again, he sounded like, you know, somebody who's smart. And I absolutely love the way Matt Pat just rips into this industry. <laughs> yeah, me too. it makes me laugh whenever, whenever he he's like, he get you know, it's bad because it's, it's like the last time it's when he got he got him and a bunch of partners got screwed. I forget what the name of the, the MCN was, but uh, I won't give him any uh, exposures. Yeah, I mean, from from my uh, advertising perspective, I have, you know, a, other perspective I see is, you know, first off, how, you know, they would take a cut from a creator's ad revenue on top of the cut from the the, the deals, right? And I knew right away that, you know, when they were talking about, like, we represent 10,000 channels. And I was like, how is that even sustainable? Like, you know, I can hardly manage five, you know, like, can you imagine, you know, managing that many? So, yeah, it's, it's, it was really interesting to see that when we joined, and I, I'm going to shut up now because it's not about me, but when we signed with Revision 3, they gave us a flat CPM and they got so screwed out of that. It's not even funny because back in the day they expected cpms to go higher right which they didn't <laughs> you know they actually went lower so uh yeah it was a great deal for us but uh they couldn't repeat it after a year they got screwed at that so a lot of vc money went towards uh some creators in that perspective great great deal if you can get it <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, we, we talk a lot about like the history of us being in the space and being in the behind the scenes and seeing a lot of the dirty work, and you know, seeing creators rise and I don't, I don't want to consider them fall, but you know, more or less stagnate when, until they disappear. Do you think there's still a place for you know somebody to build an audience on on, on, on YouTube to to build like a sizable audience? And you know, for me, this is. Speaking as somebody who's looking at Mr. Beast, who just appeared out of the last, you know, two years. It just, yeah, but he's been grinding for eight years. Exactly, right. You know, and, and you know, yeah. the short answer to your question is yes. The long answer is, um, I think the biggest difference between 2020 and, let's say, 2010, right, mm -hmm. is that back then, that actually was around the time when gaming was just coming in. And that was around the era where the algorithm um, started to favor watch time. And that's when it changed everything. It was the confluence of gaming, Minecraft, longer form videos, getting uh, more recommendations, things like that. So when I started, it was kind of just like the Oklahoma land rush. If you were there first and you were going to build an audience first, then you, got, then you lucked out. But to sustain, mm -hmm. you, and the tools necessar weren't necessarily there quite yet. The tools now are amazing. And if you'll see somebody mm -hmm. like Jimmy, you know, uh, Donaldson, Mr. Beast, like the reason why he's successful is that guy is, in addition to creating the content, he's a lot like you and I, where he dives into the numbers and he looks mm -hmm. at all the data that's being given to you. And in, and in this era, right now, I think it's, this is going to sound nuts. I think it's maybe easier than it was back then to build an audience to sustain. And I say that because the data they give you, it's right there before you. If you learn how to read the tea leaves, you can just look at your content and adjust the content to be um, data-driven, right? So if you yep. pay attention to the data-driven uh, strategy, then you know you make a content, you make a video, has a poor click-through rate, and it's got a crappy thumb and the content only, and people watch for 30 seconds, well, don't do that again. Right. Yeah. And you've got a great thumbnail, a great title, um, a, to a, a topic that is getting recommended and thrown into suggested videos because uh, people are watching for over five minutes. Replicate that. Right. Yeah. And, and, and it sounds so simple. It's not. But the, that that information did not exist until the last couple of years. So obviously, if you're able to be an early adopter on something like, say, let's say TikTok, Right. Mm -hmm. And you, you can migrate. I think it's maybe easier or not easier. You could build an audience there more quickly and maybe migrate that over to YouTube. But the, I would, I would call YouTube the, the place to sustain and you have the most data to back you up and, and, and an opportunity to create better content. That's not just, you know, 10 seconds of dancing to renegade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, I think 
sometimes I feel like a, you know, old man yelling at sky type of situation when I look at like everybody jumping on, you know, TikTok and, and anything that's hot at the moment. And then, you know, people, you know, one year, two years later realize, oh crap, I, I need to keep grinding at this or else I'm dead in the water type of situation. And whereas, you know, if you build a strong YouTube channel, you can be like, you can build a business out of that. And yes, you know, there's a lot of like news and if you read Business Insider, you know, the creators are creating, are making millions of dollars all the time, you know, and, and mm. influencers and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I feel like that's a, that's the worst type of, you know, lines to, to sort of read in this industry. Um, what, you know, for me, again, I've seen way too many instances, like you said, where you make good content that lasts and does very, really well and just rinse and repeat. And yes, evolve as well with the industry and, and with the tastes, you know, you, you can build something that's super, super sustainable. And even to this day, there's so many niches that I go like, I'm, I'm not a content producer, but I see the niches and I'm like, God damn it. Nobody's, nobody's doing this. I need to do this, <laughs> you know, yeah. but I'm not a content producer. And I'm like, oh, I just don't have the patience for that. The conversation about influencers, you work with high profile influencers and you, you have a lot of them. In, in a space and i know you're paying attention to this space even though like we tend to be away we tend to stick away from the influencer conversation but i think it's still important to sort of like understand it's there and i think you know what's happening right now with the ftc it feels like the ftc you know now that it cracked down on kids content is starting to pay much more attention about the influencer ecosystem and you know, influencer ecosystem means online creator means anybody that's creating content online and is trying to drive and make money you know, what do you think as somebody who's been in this space, and I'm sure you worked with brands as well, like, what do you think, you know, a creator or, you know, a video producer, somebody who's using this platform should be doing to protect themselves for the future? Well, what's interesting about the COPPA thing about the, on, you know, YouTube content, you know, YouTube was fined $170 million. Um, people were freaking out since last October. I have some breaking news for you. Um, it wasn't oh. as <laughs> it wasn't as devastating as most people thought it was going to be. Yes, there was a handful of videos that were sort of flagged as uh, made for kids. Um, let's say with the AB family, who I work with very closely now, mm -hmm. that is pretty much what we're focused on. We have a couple of joint ventures on some products, and we I, you know I edit a lot of their videos and come up and come up with concepts and things like that. But you know, for the most part. What happens is when your videos were flagged for COPPA and they had a, just a handful, it still made an impact because um, those videos were being suggested by very popular channels. Because as we know, a lot of these big channels were focused on kids' audiences, right? And mm -hmm. so some people were hit harder. What I can say, you know, and I asked my buddy Dane Bodeheimer, Dane Bo, about, you know, Orange, here's, you know, maybe arguably the most notable kids show in the history of YouTube and, and how is it going? Is it going to affect our gaming channel? Is it going to affect our main channel? And as it turns out, not really. So if there's an argument, what, what would happen after the fallout of the COPPA thing was, um, is it defined as a mixed audience? Cause we can make the case that, you know, you could say annoying orange is for families. You could say, mm -hmm. um, things, you know, a lot of the animation on YouTube, just cause your animation, let's say odds one out. Just because odds yeah. one out is an animated show, is that for kids? No, it's probably more for like teenagers and stoners and, you know, yeah. <laughs> stuff like that. So it, it's weird. I think the channels that were exploiting it in a, a negative way were hit hard. And there was some impact because now you're not getting as much traffic from suggested videos. But let's, let's go back to the last point we were talking about a couple minutes ago, which was now you have the data help build again. Whereas, you know, your business is mm -hmm. gone forever. You just have to pivot. And one thing yep. is a certain in the 15 years that I've been working with YouTube is that everything always changes. You can't settle into, you know, a robotic, you know, production line of content uh, because everything's going to change every year. There's mm -hmm. going to be new trends. There's going to be new strategies. And if you're not willing to at least have one foot in the art and one foot in the tech, you're probably not going to last long and, or you have to work with somebody who does one or the other, you know, 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I, I've had that experience lately with a client that uh, had a significant, you know, channel and that was sort of like going in a little bit of a downspin, but sort of recovered, but only to realize that even though they've been in the space for so long, they've only focused on a production. Like they were just lucky they found a format that really hit. Yeah. They never really looked at it. Obviously they were happy to get those paychecks, but they never really understood how things were growing or what needed to be done. I mean, there were things being done, but it's just, it's, it's weird. It's almost like they went into this automatic, you know, they went into cruise control and then that's it. This is all we do and we don't change it. Right. And it's a very, I feel like a, as somebody who's ex exposed to production companies, it feels like very much like a production company mindset where it's like they find them a, a format, a model, and they just do not change it until somebody says the show's canceled. <laughs> you know, yeah. I find creators can be a little bit more aware of, of things changing, if it's shifting, but I do see a lot of them not be aware and just like, oh, all of a sudden my channel's dead. And, you know, even though I have 10 million, 10 million subscribers, I'm only getting uh, 50,000 views or 10,000 views type of situation. And it's like, why? You know, well, you know, it's like you haven't changed your audience growing up like 15 years. Yeah. You're not talking to the same kids, you know, all that sort of stuff. Right. So, yeah. yeah, that's all things that people need to sort of pay attention to. You know, let's talk about like the platforms like TikTok's the word on the street these days. Uh, if, if, you know, there's not one platform out there that you go on where there's not a, 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 a free booted TikTok video these days. Right. I feel like it's, you know, I'm, I'm again, grumpy old man screaming in the air, but like, I feel like it's, it's literally like, it's one of those like 15 minutes. It's, it's on the 13th minute type of, or 13 seconds. Is it 15 seconds or 15 minutes uh, fame? Um, it's on the 13th minute type of situation that I feel. But how do you feel like having seen them come and go and you're an investor, you're paying attention to, the, to these apps coming up, up and coming and going. So love your perspective. Yeah, it's not going anywhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what TikTok strength was that nobody could catch up to them um, once they bought Musical.ly for a billion, integrated those things. And they also have, I mean, they've got tons of money. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's paired with uh, an app called Douyin, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, in China, which is essentially the same thing, but it's not TikTok. TikTok is the mm. you know, primarily U.S. English version, probably maybe Western Hemisphere version. Um, not sure if it's being used in South America. But to me, what Byte's biggest mistake was, and I follow Dom Hoffman pretty closely on Twitter, he was a co-founder of Vine, is that they waited too long. You know, um, yeah. I, I knew that year... When Twitter, Twitter bought Vine for 30 million bucks, right? And then mm -hmm. sat on it for two years. I mean, Vine came in and became the cultural zeitgeist over YouTube very quick, right? Like, boom. Yep. And, but it started, people needed to, to pivot into longer form content. And I was at VidCon. I've been to every VidCon. And I went straight to the stage because of the head of video product at, at Twitter. I was excited to, I wanted to hear the new, what they're going to do. I was hoping, let's go partner program, longer format. You know, Twitter's in the game. They have the hottest video thing. And nothing was announced. No new product. Mm -hmm. No nothing. And essentially what happened is their Twitter earnings were going in the toilet. And they they basically shut down Vine, broke everybody's hearts, which was like three years ago, four years ago. Yep. And everybody on the platform. But that's actually... Um, they, they did it basically to save face on the stock price. That's That's what happened. You know, and buying it, you mean Twitter, Twitter's stock price. Oh, okay. They yeah. Dumped, you mean buying they, vine? That's what they did. No, no, no. Dumping vine. Right. Oh, dumping vine. Okay, dumping yeah, yeah. vine because it was becoming, you know, they hadn't, they hadn't monetized it. They hadn't yeah, yeah, done yeah. anything. And so what, what was happening at the time, which was funny in Snapchat, everybody wanted to go to snap because that was new and Snapchat. Mm -hmm. I had some friends that worked there and basically they were frustrated because they're saying, no, you want the influencers. And they're like, we don't care about these influencers. Right. Mm -hmm. And they, yep. they, they messed that up too. So what was, what left the void musically and then TikTok bought musically. And now it's been the replace. I have two teenagers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Teenage girls. It's, they were used to be all be about the vine and now they're all about TikTok. It's short form. It's fun. It's meme related. Right. Which yep. is all they care about. That's how this, you speak teenager. You got to speak meme. And I think that, you know, bite to come in and compete with that without all the bells and whistles that these kids are already used to. Uh, yeah. And it's a dog, 
you know. And so there's mm-hmm. other places in the space, some short form apps like Firework, um, you know. I, I, another one called I, I forget what it was called. Yeah, there's a few, and then who knows? Like, but what do they offer that's different than TikTok? I don't know. What do you think? I think those companies are probably just launched with the right fund, probably in Silicon Valley, where um, they can try to throw out some pieces of like Google's going to have to acquire us now. No, they're not. Yeah. <laughs> no. Like, if YouTube wants to get in the short form game, which I think they should consider something, uh, it doesn't need, mean they need to rush to acquisition, or they could find another. How do I say this? They could find another niche that's not being covered and not have to just keep playing catch up because they don't want to have a, a Google Plus event again. You know what I mean? No. And um, it's funny. One of the companies that I advise is a Toronto company called Stage 10. And Stage 10 really kind of has a product that I'm very excited about, if you don't mind me talking about it. No, no, go ahead. It's called Rosie. Rosie.tv. R-O-Z-Y dot TV. And it's sort of you, know, you pick up your phone it's a live show that integrates directly with your shopify channel and turns your shopify in- channel into like people purchase it you see the stuff oh so and so just bought this on screen it's like game of it's like watching gaming but through e-commerce right yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, when i saw it i was like oh my god you invented a new genre and it's backed up by purchase um, this is going to be huge Hmm. To me, if I'm one of the major platforms, I'd want to go after this product because it, it's not trying to be TikTok. It's not trying to be Twitch, right? And YouTube gaming yeah. is successful on its own, right? But if Google, I would focus on something new. And when there's something new and it hasn't been in our business for a while, you know, it's, it's very rare, right? Yeah. I think that when there's something new, you can really you can really create something that is a dominant market force. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's what I think TikTok is. Yeah. yeah. And full disclosure, you, you know, you talked to me about stage 10 previously a couple of weeks ago as we were prepping for did this you ever call. Go down here? And yes, I did. I uh, oh. met with them a couple of weeks ago and I was blown away. And I don't want to sort of like, you know, oversell at this point because I actually want to have them on the podcast uh, in the near future. Oh, wonderful. But uh, yeah, their product is really interesting and it's, it's, but the thing is, uh, the way I see it is, is it's not going to be a new platform. It's going to be a new feature on, on all the platforms. And if they play their cards right, and again, I'm not an investor. I'm not, you know, I'm just like, you know, guy uh, putting his finger in the air and sort of, you know, yeah. seeing where the wind's going. But the way I see it is, it's it's uh, it has so many features that all these platforms are dreaming about. Yeah, somebody's going to take it over, or somebody's going to buy it, somebody's going to figure it out. And yeah, I think you're right. Like in, in terms of everything, right now, it's like uh, as we speak. I think this week and this episode will probably you know be, has a, at least a month ahead before it, it goes live. But um, Twitter just bought another company that's uh, specialized in stories. It feels like every single digital app, social app is is just turning into a story platform. Hmm. Um, the internet is essentially stories now. That short form content, which is great. It's great for in the moment, like you're bored, you just want to watch something for two seconds or five seconds or 15 seconds, whatever the, the attention span of kids these days. But you know, one of the things that I, I've heard through friends who used to work at TikTok is that TikTok's desperate to age up. Like they realized oh, yeah. that it's like, yeah, there's, they scaled up quickly, but all this audience is complete crap when it comes to like making money. <laughs> right. I mean, when you, again, right. this is all the pieces coming together. Like, well, this is why YouTube's cleaning its act up is because, Hey, the real money is adult audiences with money to spend. Yes. Everybody jumps into the viral thing because the kids are there, but the kids, do influence the parents but it's like the parents still buy cars right that's not, you know they still buy high price products and those high price products spend way more money to acquire that client so anyways that, that there's a no, big that's tangent a great point. you can go into that right and you know to me that's again anybody who's listening to this podcast and i'm going to shut up soon again but is you know youtube has always been and it's better now but it has always been sort of the oh leftover cousin of advertising where 
people would be like, I'd rather buy my CPMs on my, my pre-rolls on MSN.com. And I don't even know if MSN.com is still a thing uh, <laughs> on MSN.com. Yeah. I'd pay, you know, 30, $40 CPMs. And then, you know, Oh, at the end of my, you know, planning budget. And I look, Oh, I have $10,000 to spend this month. Just throw it on YouTube and don't think about it too much. I'm sure that's evolved a lot. But um, I still think, you know, YouTube uh, ha has that reputation in some markets. So let's go back to all these questions that I have. Um, yeah, you mentioned the AB, which are friends of mine as well. And this is actually how we started talking to each other. <laughs> Even though I, I was following you and I knew who you were, like, you know, uh, the AB family, uh, we were friends. We met them. Me and my wife met them like years ago when they were big on Vine. And I was like, you know, you know, busting their balls and saying, pardon my French, but saying like, Hey man, you too, man, you need to like move a little bit because Vine's hot and everything, but you know, and I'm not going to take credit at all for that. But I'm sure other people were telling him that for that and they're experimenting and they've done great since. What do you do with them? Like, how do you help a creator at creators like the AB who, you know, they're about to hit 10 million subscribers. Like they're, they're, they're pretty, yeah, you know, probably this year. Um, <laughs> Yeah. It's not early next year, but like to me, this is how it works. So in addition to doing Annoying Orange in LA and we had, you know, the Cartoon Network show, things were a lot of fun, but you're, that's what's happening currently. Uh, y you already know what's going to happen. Like as you're planning for the next year where the business is going. And so at that time, um, one of my best friends that I grew up in with in Lemister, Massachusetts, uh, a guy named Tony Serafini, he was a vine dad and he knew, um, the AB family and they, he sort of introduced me to him. I, I thought, he, I thought he was hilarious. And I thought that his daughter was, I come to find out later, she was only seven or six, like when they started. And I was like, what? Um, and now Gabby's touring with walk off the earth. She's an incredibly talented kid. She's 13. But anyways, uh, I was at buffer speaking, uh, at the buffer festival a few years back. And I, and that's exactly what you were saying to him. I, I, I met him for a burger and I was like, listen to me. I've been doing this a while. I don't <laughs> trust Twitter. I don't, tw I don't trust Vine, believe it or not. And yeah. he's like, you think? And I was like, immediately I said, get on Facebook, get on YouTube, especially oh, YouTube. You can go make money like now, you know? Mm -hmm. And he listened. And you know, a few years later, actually it was uh, about a year and a half ago. Here I am in Colorado. I'm going out to VidCon. I'm, I'm doing a few advisory things here and there. And he tells me that, you know, I think we're going to start some new channels. And I kind of just put my soda down and I looked him right in the eye and I said, look, you're going to need help. Mm -hmm. This, I go, this is, it's, you think you can do this, but you'll burn yourself out. Plus we get along when we talk about the business, like the stuff we're talking about here, but also in terms of like very simple stuff. What do you want, you know, in a few years for, how are we going to evolve AB? Because they know he's, he's a, he's a very, Andres Burgos is a very smart business guy, in my opinion. He can see down the pipe mm -hmm. and, and he can, he's, he's willing to put the work in strategically before, um, creating the content. You know what I mean? Like versus saying, I'm just going to create content mm -hmm. and because we have an audience, everyone's going to watch it. Yeah. That's not how it works in 2020, mm -hmm. you know? So for me, I was, it was just a really good fit. And since then we've, um, we've developed with one of my product partners in California, Paul Schrader of Minimus Brands. Uh, we've developed, uh, a, a, a healthier energy drink in the East, in the esports area that will be sort of mm -hmm. uh, bringing out later this year. And we've got some other creative partners coming in on that. We launched a video game called uh, Battle Bees. Yeah, yeah and that. it's growing slowly, but it's it's one of those games that once you build that audience, it's going to be a very loyal audience. We're excited about that. So when it comes to you know the sort of product development, business development stuff, like it definitely helps to have. Well, I have a lot of connections to do it, but also two two brains are better than one. Yes, that's why I feel like I guess I'm the first member of their team. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. And I operate independently, but like basically I'm not their manager, but if it calls for me to do something like a manager, I'll do it. Um, and I don't know any other managers who's, you know, edit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? So it, it's a mix of everything. And then I think that's why you and I have good conversations because you have, we have experience doing lots of different, um, 
wearing a lot of different yeah. hats in this business. You yeah. Know what I mean? And the things, uh, again, I, I smile so much when you talk about that because I've known Andreas for like four or five years now and everything you've been, you told him is stuff that I've been like harping on him. I have histories of yeah. chats on him. I'm like, dude, are you thinking about this? Dude, are you doing this? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I don't have time to do that right now. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm glad that he found you and that you guys are working together, but I could have been you, <laughs> damn it. Um, but I don't edit. So well, that's what you needed bandwidth for that. I've been editing for 20 years and, um, I can go pretty fast. It's like, it's like playing. I always tell my wife it's like playing guitar. If you know how to play guitar, yeah, it's 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 really quick to lay down a track. <laughs> you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, my my uh, my uh, my cousin Joe, who who uh, edits this podcast, he's a musician and a producer, so he knows exactly what you're talking about right now. He's probably gonna be laughing. Um, yeah, and then funny enough, I've fallen into the same sort of role recently with a local creator duo that. I helped advise many years ago and I said, you should be paying attention to this, this, this. And then they went on their own, they grew and all that sort of stuff. And now they're back. They basically came calling back and they're like, Hey, we need you because you know how to make money in this space. And I'm like, yeah, that's sort of the point here. Like if you just, if you just post on Instagram and you know, you stop, you realize that people stop calling as well. So you need to figure out something to make money while you're not posting on Instagram. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a fun role. It's a bit, uh, it's, it's, it's demanding, but, uh, it's fun. I love, I love this space and I don't consider myself a, manager. I just advise right. more than anything else and find connections. I, I wanted, I, I wanted to say something earlier. I forgot. And I remembered Go for it. one of the, so I, I left, um, Los Angeles in 2014 and now I still go there for, you know, events and things like that. There YouTube has never been more exciting to me than not living in that LA centric sort of fame driven celebrity type culture yes. things. YouTube is so much bigger mm -hmm. and the space is so much bigger and, and interesting. If you look at it as like uh, an independent business person first um, to me, if you're starting any business, you need to understand that part of your business is going to be media and it never any point in the history of the entire world have you had better tools in order to brand build. Um, doesn't have to be quickly, but it can be very quick. Yeah. Like if you have a product, you can build a culture around that product very quickly, get a great logo on 99 designs or Fiverr and come up with a consistent upload schedule on Instagram and YouTube. And the next thing you know, you're, and then you do targeted marketing on Facebook for your product. Right. And the next thing you know, boom, you've, you're, you're making mm -hmm. e an e-commerce business. Yeah. I think that that type of, I mean, it's so exciting to me. I could care less. I mean, I could not care less about, you know, some model mm -hmm. on Instagram. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Or some next, the next funny, you know, kid on YouTube is a vlogger because we talk about sustainability, right? Yeah. And some people, so, that's just the nature of things. People get bored with the same old crap or the same old person, especially when you live in an era of unlimited choice. Yeah. So unless you've got a diversified uh, monetization strategy, again, um, across the platforms, brand deals, at AdSense, are you making your own products? Do you have a video game for sale? You know, all these types of things. And who can do that at scale without a team? No, nobody. And that's, that's a, nobody. Yeah. And then the thing is that that's a little bit of the problematic of, of, of creators in a way, because uh, again, this is me having conversations with creators and trying to help them in, in certain ways. And I'm, I never go, go in like selling them. I'm just saying like, Hey, you can always sort of ask me a question. I'm not selling you anything is you try to help them. And then they're like, they take off by themselves. And then they're like, I can do it all. I can do it all. I built this. I do can do it all. And then, and then they, they and right. then they burn out in summary. And that's like, I feel and they burn out and they lose their entire business. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I've seen it happen quite a few times now. It's not a question about having outside, you know, like uh, having somebody poke in and obviously, you know, again, Hollywood came calling, picked at everybody, you know, made everybody super suspicious, which is fine. I get it. As soon as anybody approaches a creator these days, it's like, what are you trying to rip me off from? So 
you know, I've always helped creators more than it. I've given more than I've taken in terms of that, because I say one day they're going to, you know, recommend me and they'll say something and somebody's going to need help. And it happened mm -hmm. recently where I got a client that was basically through a friend that, you know, I've been helping and advising and giving uh, insights for her. And he didn't need help. But, you know, when somebody came calling for him, he's like, no, I know Carlos is going to help him out. So I was, you know, that's a little bit. Of no, I agree. That's exactly how it's done. Yeah. One thing I think is important about clients or people you want to work with is, is that just because a creator has an online following doesn't mean it's a person that you want to get in business with. True. One of the rarities in our business is some is somebody who's a creator who's built an audience but understands the power behind that and has the humility and 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 i, I would never want to work with somebody who's like a giant ego jake paul type person right man i can't um, even imagine in fact, i i have i have colleagues i have colleagues who've turned down their business oh man and it's it's because who wants to get in that rat's nest ultimately if you're going to do what you know like a joint venture like let's say it's um a subscription box service yep. and you find two or three gamer people that are perfect to help not only promote it, but let's get some cash in and let's build a business around this and get a contract. And if, if you have one of those people and they're like, Oh, their eyes roll back in their head and they don't know like, wait, this is too much for me. Then it's like, okay, I don't even want to talk to this person. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And you know, that's why the, the smartest managers are really business development, you know, um, partners mm -hmm. for these channels. One kid I'm very impressed with is Preston Place, mm -hmm. and Preston is out of Houston. I've met him a couple times. Once at the Roblox headquarters. That's when I first met him, and then I talked to him this year at Bid Summit. And his manager is very impressive to me. His name's Reed, and he I think he handles Mr. Beast and like Dude Perfect and like maybe two or three other people, and that's his roster. Yeah, he doesn't go out. And try to try to be Studio Seventy One, <laughs> or try to be like this giant place of you know just you know let's get down on Wilshire and everybody we know everything. It's like you can have Hollywood. Who needs Hollywood? No, no. no. I was I'm so glad that I I don't live in that ecosystem of BS essentially. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Butler lives in where? North Carolina. Yeah. Somewhere. Well, I mean, uh, here's the thing. Like, I, I, oh, I sorry, Jimmy, Jimmy, uh, Mr. Beast. Sorry. Yeah, and then here's the thing. Like, I look at um, again. I, I, I speak from from experience here. I look at uh, you know Roman Atwood. He lives in Columbus, Ohio. Like, could you imagine? Ohio, you know, right. Could you imagine like having you know a channel with 15 million subscribers? Two channels actually. One with 10. One for 15 now. And you know whatever amount of money he's making in living in Ohio where it costs him nothing to live. And, you know, he can just, yeah, he can just, I, I can imagine that yeah, all day long. Exactly. Right. <laughs> and, you know, there's so yeah. many creators that got washed, to, you know, got sold to the LA thing. And it's like, yeah, it didn't give you anything. I still have doubts about a certain, you know, creator who's, who's got a late night show right now. And it's like nothing against that person. I think they're awesome. I just think that was a that's an agent that sold you that as opposed to like what's really good for yeah, you. I know who you're talking about and she does not belong in late night. And it's too bad because she had a business that was thriving yep. and somebody said you should be doing this. Yes. versus what do you want to do? Exactly. That that's not their place to try to mold somebody into something that they're not. Yeah. I do not want them to fail. It's just that it doesn't feel like it's it's natural for me from my perspective and again i don't know these people so uh it's just uh it's pretty obvious i mean and yeah <laughs> <laughs> look i did cut this out right but like drew gooden did a wonderful commentary video that's hilarious but also just kind of tears her new ass this is liza you know and it's for kind of what, what's the thing that makes youtubers special or online personality special it's the access to the authenticity right? yeah all of a sudden that is gone using a late night format which is you know quickly becoming an antiquated format right <laughs> well they're they're it's they're basically giant, taking over youtube right <laughs> that's the funny part well i mean well i think that i always thought that would actually happen when i was working afi and i was still doing youtube i actually i almost reached out to conan's people i kind of wish i did but i didn't mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to be like, look, every single one of your bits is a video. Every single one of your shows can be, can you know, you can cut out the monologue, you can cut out the, you know, in the year 2000, and you can crank content on YouTube. At the time, um, because it's very Hollywood and very egocentric, they, they didn't look at it as opportunity. They looked at it as like, ah, 
I would never put my content on YouTube. <laughs> oh, God, you know, and now, like you said, they, they, they're some of the biggest channels and that's fine. I, I don't, I don't, I think YouTube, I think a lot of, there's a big misconception about, um, who you should be competitive with. Number one, nobody. Yeah. Um, sure. You can look to people and say, Oh man, I wish I had their numbers or I want to make content like this. But the way the algo works is if anything, if your content's funny, let's say it's funny mm -hmm. and it's similar and has similar watch time, you will be suggested from those people. Yeah. You're not, you're not competing with them. And honestly, if you want to make content and you're pissed off that Jimmy Fallon's getting more views, then you're focusing on the wrong things. Yeah. You're, you're not, you're not focusing on your business and you're not focusing on content creation. Yeah, it's it's quite funny. Jelly. The anecdote of like uh, being snobbish for for YouTube. I think that was, you know, it's funny because I'm I'm in a space right now where all these TV producers are begging me. They're reaching out to me. And they're like, "Hey, I saw that YouTube Kids is investing a hundred million dollars in content." And they're like, "How do I get that?" And I'm like, <laughs> "All that sort of stuff." And how do I get in touch with somebody? And I was like, you know, first off, you're in the wrong market. And nobody in Canada is going to help you out. But, you know, at the same time, like, you know, I hear stories about, you know, production companies here desperate for any sort of like YouTube success. And it's, it's quite funny to see that, you know, how that, the, that's sort of re reversed in a way. We need to wrap up. One of my missions in the next year is to find a time to uh, hang out with you in real life because I know we'd have uh, great conversations. Yeah. What's keeping you busy these days? What's your like day to day that, you know? Oh, okay. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that most excites me going into 2020 and sort of where I see myself in this space is I think I have a better understanding now than ever about creating brands. And I, when I say brands, I, I'm very excited about the partnerships I have with Minimus Brands because um, he's got some pretty high profile A-list celebrities and I'm kind of handling bringing in sort of online uh, success uh, stories and, you know, people like the ABs mm -hmm. and, and some others. Um, I'm very excited about what I like to call, and it sounds corny, brand disruption. <laughs> no, I totally get it. I mean by that is like right now, um, if I put together a team of, let's say, three key creators and between them, they've got 30 million subscribers and like a really dedicated you know, audience. And I'm not talking about selling merch. I'm talking about utilizing their influence to be a catalyst for a brand new pr product. It could be innovative. It could be competitive, mm. like a drink, right? Yeah. And using yeah. it to eat up some market share very quickly and get it into places like Target and Walmart. That's definitely doable, mm -hmm. especially because of the people I'm working with. That to me fires me up because what can happen there is essentially you've got almost like a zero cost startup company, right? Yep. And you have strategic investors for, you know, the creators and you, you go after that market share. And if you eat up any of the major brands, let's say it's Pepsi or Coke, um, essentially what you've done for them is R and D and you're primed for uh, acquisition. Yep. That to me seems like I want to rinse and repeat that for the next three years and then I'll, Peace out. <laughs> Here, here's my my take, and this is deviates from what we're talking about. It's more of a startup world, but I think most direct yeah. consumer or DTC products are R and D campaigns for big brands. Essentially, you know, here's here's my thesis. Uh, Casper is you know went public, but everybody was sort of like the, an analyst. Anybody with brain says it's, it's going to flop, and it did. Is essentially yeah. a marketing campaign for Serta. Serta is going to come in. It's like, you guys figured this out. You did an awesome digital thing. We're just going to buy you and you're, we're going to take your process into our process. And that's essentially what many of these, of these, of these startups are. If you can essentially disrupt an industry by building a leaner machine under them and just piggybacking off their, their product. And again, I feel like we're de really deviating from the kind of subject matter here, but the, again, this is my perception of things. It, 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 you'll go in, you'll build something that's like super streamlined, super cheap to make, and all that sort of stuff, and a product a product that people love, obviously. Although I, I, I'm questioning, you know, how much love there is when it comes to Casper. <laughs> but somebody will just go in and just, you know, buy your process and just take it. That's why, you know, Dollar Shave Club, right? They were disrupting, you know, Schick or Gillette. Guess who bought them? 
whatever yeah. company. I it's, it's one of my favorite stories of all. Exactly time. right. It, it's just it's, imagine that guy, uh, the Dollar Shave Club guy, uh, who I you know don't remember the name off the top of my head. He's the marketing exec who pitched the idea to Gillette. Gillette's no no effing way. Like we're not selling things for this. And it's like, well, there's a market. And they're like, no, people want to buy, you know, twenty dollar blades. And it's like, no. <laughs> and and he did it anyways. He got VCs to 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 pay for the runway until until Gillette's like, holy crap, they're taking a piece out of their again, I'm not even sure if it's the same company as Gillette at the bottom, but uh, the example here is that that's I just want to sort of like make that uh, there's a lot of startups that are just running on fumes until somebody comes in and says, you know, we want to just absorb your process and just come into our system. But we're not a startup uh, podcast, but that's my two cents on the startup equation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with all of it. Uh, Bob, uh, thank you very much. Where can people connect with you on the internet? The easiest way is to check out uh, my Twitter, Bob Jens, and my YouTube, Bob Jens. Um, I will be trying to make time to make some content because the more you, you get in that process, you, you're closer to it. And if I'm making content for the ABs, I want to make sure that I, I'm on top of all the trends and things like that. So YouTube and Twitter, just Bob Jett. Awesome. I'll put links in the, in the description. Thanks a lot, Bob. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob, for joining me on the call. That was quite an enlightening and amazing to see that, you know, there's these people out there that are sort of like not really front facing in terms of, you know, there's, we're surrounded by a lot of like YouTube gurus and advisors. So we kind of think they're all over the place. Those are the only ones, but there's a lot of people behind the scenes like Bob who've been around the bend. And, you know, have such a, a wide perspective of what, what's been going on, what's happened. So it was really fun to have a conversation with Bob. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. And I definitely, straight off the bat, I just knew, like, Bob's cut from the same cloth as us, Carlos. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> you know, just a little bit snarky. And, you know, it's people like Bob that really, really, really just get my respect because they're just scurrying behind the scenes, just doing great work, just smashing it out of the park on in whatever they put their hand to. And, you know, it's people like that that you, you need to surround yourself with people like that and find out what they're doing, what's working, what's, you know, what's no longer working, what's, what's getting their focus because these are the kind of people that, you know, they know where the puck's going to be rather than, rather than where the puck is, Yeah, which you would understand being – canadians <laughs> and so, a correction to my thing uh, my you know my intro he plays the grapefruit in grapefruit. annoying orange okay. cool, <laughs> cool cool and um yeah no so I, I really found that just just totally fascinating and um and he's in the right place because these creators they do need help they're not business people by definition they're leaving so much money on the table and if someone like Bob can come along and just open up whole new revenue streams, then, you know, then they're, they're definitely deserving of a cut of that take and uh, a seat at the table with, with uh, kind of big creators. So yeah, really interesting stuff. Yeah. Me and him have, uh, you know, have a mutual friends and me and him sort of say the same advice. I heard of, you know, Bob being the, the other guy talking that, you know, uh, friend creator was talking to me and Bob started talking and I realized we're both telling this guy the same thing. Yeah. We've been telling him for the same thing. So we sort of realized that we're both sort of like on the same wavelength. So again, uh, make sure you're following Bob. He's also, you know, he also has his own YouTube channel, although he just experiments and just does crazy stuff, but he's obviously been, you know, I think anybody in this business, uh, who does this sort of wants to do a couple of like things here and there. So, I, th I know he's 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 done much more YouTube than both of us, but a man of all trades. I don't know if that, that's not the right saying. But jack of all a, trades. A jack of all trades. Yeah, that's the right thing. I loved right. um, at one point, you know, the kind of key quote for me, and I think this really goes to kind of play service to people like me and Bob and you, Carlos, and and it's that he's very data driven, but also I think the quote was that kind of works if you can read the tea leaves. So oh, everyone's oh. got, everyone's got access to YouTube analytics. Everyone's got access to this data, but if you don't know how to tease out the insight from that data, if you can't separate 
correlation from causation. Again, this is something that me and Mark Robertson were speaking about uh, in person the other week at VidCon London. Uh, throw back to that episode that, w- that came out a few weeks ago. Really, really important is to be able to actually make you know, useful insights that actually make a difference from YouTube data then rather than just saying, this is the data, like what can we actually learn from that and what action can we take from that? So yeah, a big kudos to, uh, to Bob for really kind of driving that home. And he, I think he, he distilled that really well. Yes. Thanks again, Bob. So before we wrap up, I want to thank TubeBuddy. TubeBuddy is the ultimate tool for creators to streamline their daily workflow on YouTube, allowing for more time to make great content. For brands to help reduce busy work and focus on what matters, growing your business on YouTube. For agencies to help manage multiple client channels and for networks, which gives partners the tools for success and an attractive incentive for recruitment. We have a special offer. Tom, tell our audience how they can sign up. Yes, you can get an exclusive, world exclusive, multi channel <laughs> discount by visiting videoinsiders.fm forward slash TubeBuddy. Thank you, TubeBuddy. Cheers, TubeBuddy. If you enjoyed the show, please give us a thumbs up, a review, a five star, uh, wherever you're listening. And obviously share us with somebody in your ecosystem that would really enjoy hearing our stories. You can also give us your feedback by email. Uh, Let us know what you think. Let us know if there's an issue you want us to discuss or if there's someone in the industry you think we should be speaking to on the podcast. You can email us hello at videoinsiders.fm or we are at videoinsiders on all the socials. Until then, we will speak to you in a couple of weeks. See you in a couple of weeks.